I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though this body be destroyed, yet shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not as a stranger. For none of us lives to himself, and no man dies to himself. For if we live, we live unto the Lord, and if we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, even so says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. Good afternoon, my name is Youngman. I'm pastor here at Hoosick Falls Community Alliance Church, where Alfred often worshipped. I would like to welcome you to this service of celebration. We are gathered here this afternoon in the memory of Alfred John Emanuel Smith Eberly who died peacefully on December 26th. As we remember him, our sincere sympathies and prayer support are extended to his whole family and his many friends gathered here for this service. The Bible portrays death as our enemy. In fact, as the final enemy of mankind, it's an enemy that brings separation, pain, and grief to those who remain. But it is an enemy that's been overcome by Christ, who in his own resurrection offers us the possibility of life in which death becomes not a fearsome event, but the joyous entrance into eternal life with God our Savior and the hosts of believers through the ages to enjoy God's presence forever. But death does bring grief and adjustments. Life is not the same for those who remain. So while the hope of eternal life is real, so also is the pain. Let us therefore turn to God in prayer that we may receive comfort and help from the God of all comfort. After I pray, we will hear a lovely rendition of the Lord's Prayer. If you'd kindly bow your heads and open your hearts, I'd like to speak to the Lord. We take comfort, our Father, in the realism of your word that tells us that the days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. This realism, O Lord, sobers us. Give your grace to meet the grief needs of both family and friend. Gift us with the spirit of wisdom that we may understand the times. Help us, even through the pain, to celebrate Al's life and to remember the good things he brought into our relationship with him. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. And now if you'd kindly give your attention to the Lord's Prayer sung for us.
from the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. For against such there is no law. I'd like to give opportunity now for any who would like to share a fond remembrance of Al. If you'd kindly come and uh, use the mic, there is a number of family and friends who are uh, participating and worshiping with us today uh, via the live stream. And so we'd especially like any, any sharings, uh, any remembrances that you have uh, to be heard by those at home. Uh, so uh, feel free uh, to just come to the mic to share. There are many things I could say about my father. After knowing him for almost 68 years, he was the most wonderful person I ever knew. But I tried to sum it up and I tried to um, write it down so my thoughts would not be so random. Our daddy was the 10th child from a family of, I don't know if it was 12 or 13, but though he did not achieve that goal, he did have six children of which I am the oldest. Being the oldest had its privileges. I remember sitting on Grandfather Jack's green toolbox and watching him paint signs and do gold leaf. When he came home from the night shift, instead of going to bed, he would wake us up to get ready for school, making sure to make us warm cream of wheat and warming our boots by the coal stove. I know he loved me deeply. He never held back his hugs and affection. At 10 years old, it was my dream to have a blue two-wheeler bike. So on my birthday, we walked to the Firestone store where Hoosick Provisions is now, and he fulfilled that dream. On my 13th birthday, we walked to the Canary House at the corner of Main and Elm Street, which no longer stands, and he purchased me a yellow canary with a black spot on his head with the silver dimes that he had saved up. I named him Sonny. Daddy and I taught Sonny to sing Strauss's The Blue Danube. <laughs> One day, I thought Sonny was sick, so I crushed an aspirin and put it in his water. Um, I was kind of being a nurse back then, I guess but he stiffened up and fell off his perch and died. <laughs> I mourned him for days. Daddy dug a hole, put Sonny in his shoebox, and we lowered him into the ground in the yard. And this really was my first grieving experience. Later that year, during an, doing an errand for my father, I rode my blue bike to Odell's store. And on the way there, my bike tire caught on something on the train track and I fell off the bike, hitting my head on the rail, receiving a severe concussion for which I was hospitalized. There was a time in my family's life for four years that we did not have a car. So daddy would walk to Bennington every day to visit me at the hospital. <clears throat> also during this time of no car, once a week daddy and I would walk from our house on Elm Street to Clay Hill to Al Bovage's store to get our family's food. We would walk home with these heavy boxes. Daddy and I would rest our loads at the shop bridge. Stemming back from daddy's boyhood, when he would attend the flower boxes at the hotel where his dad was the prop proprietor. Um, he also decided that he wanted us to have um, flower boxes and plant, our, plant them on our Elm Street porch. They smelled so sweet. They seemed to be especially fragrant on a warm summer evening. Daddy said 
he wasn't afraid of anything. During storms, we would sit on the porch, dry from the rain. He told me not to be afraid of the storm and never to be afraid of anything. One time, while in nursing school, I was homesick and discouraged, so I left the dorm and went to the pay phone and called him up, and I asked him to come and get me. He refused, telling me that I had to stay there and do a good job and never give up. During the last four years, I was able to give back some of the love and kindness he had extended to me. He became less independent and weaker, but I never heard him complain even one time. My husband, Billy, and I, and all of our friends and, and people in church, we had so much fun with him. It was my privilege and honor to be his main caretaker until the day he went to heaven. He always had a song for me, such as Paper Doll, It's a Sin to Tell a Lie, Birthday of a King, Down by the Old Mill Stream, and many others which I won't mention. <laughs> His last song he sang to me two days before he died from his favorite green chair was There's an Old Spinning Wheel in the Parlor, Spinning Dreams of the Long, Long Ago. Turn back the years of my childhood as you turn, old spinning wheel. Just show me a lane with a barefoot boy as shadows softly steal. So I'm going to say, so long, Daddy. I'll miss and love you for the rest of my life, but I know I'll see you in heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Would anyone else like to share? Come right to the mic, please, Jim. I think I, I think I may know something about Al that his family doesn't know. Um, I had I had the privilege of visiting him, and um, I'll tell that at the end. But um, it was always a privilege for me to visit someone in that generation. To me, he qualified for the greatest generation, and 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 that, that's. And then he was obviously surrounded by all those people that were, pre, you know, that predated him, that had that work ethic and that life ethic, that, that ability to appreciate the little things. And that's what I, that's what I saw in Al. And um, particularly, uh, he, would, he would always point out to me, every time I saw him either at his place or here, we'd talk about the deer that would visit his window. He never shot him. <laughs> to my knowledge, um, uh, but uh, he, he, that, that was that was always a big moment, and that was very special special to share. And another um, uh, uh, another thing that uh, th that I really liked about Al was that uh, his his confidence and his his simple way of expressing that confidence and that positive. He, um, for instance, he, he he really liked his car. And there was a, a time when uh, he, he probably wasn't supposed to be driving. And uh, we've all had that experience with, with, with our parents. But um, he would talk about wanting to go to Bennington. And it would kind of freak out Joanne a little bit. And he'd explain it to me uh, how he was going to go. And very matter of fact, uh, but the fact is I don't know that he really went many of those times. But in any event, um, he talked about it like that it's a big deal. It was, it was just special, a small, a small little thing like that. The one thing I wanted to share, though, that I don't think the family knows is um, we're familiar today that um, there's a lot of places out there that are where well, you live, work, and play in the same place. The, the, the yuppie generation, they live there, they work there, they play there. Well, Al was ahead of his time, okay? Where he lives now he used to run the place, right? He, 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 was, he worked there. So I said, yeah, he was, a, he was ahead of his time. I just wanted to point that out. And his playing was hopping in his car and going to Bennington. But anyway, I just wanted to share that Al is, I mean, he, he was just a special guy. And it, the, uh, whenever I would see him, he, he, he would just make my day. Amen. Thank you, Jim. 
Yes. The Stacys never lack for words. <laughs> so um, I've known, had known Al for quite a long time. Um, Joanne, since 1990, working together. And then Al, when I was new in my career as a nurse practitioner, also when I knew the Brown family with very young children. So I remember him as just having this great spirit. I would look forward to his visits and he was just one of those special patients. It was such a pleasure when we started to come to church here to see Al again. So I had him, so that was, you know, when he was in his 70s up until he was in his 90s, and then to be with him his last two days. Um, there is nothing like that. And for people who haven't experienced giving care to a parent, it's the best gift that you can give them, and it's the gift that you get back from doing that. Mm -hmm. So really, really wonderful. And the only regret I have from that time was that he and my dad didn't get time to spend together because they would have been a holy terror. <laughs> <laughs> and both love the Lord. So that's... And that's my remembrance of, of Val. Thanks, Beth. Anybody else? Deb, please come forward. My first remembrance of Al probably was before I even knew Bill and Joanne well. But we had hired a man to come and put wallpaper in our house. And we thought it was a good idea to have the wallpaper installed while we were away on vacation. Don't ever do that. <laughs> <laughs> so we came home. We came home from our vacation excited to see our wallpaper. I just, there are no words. It was the, the poor person who installed the wallpaper must have had a nervous breakdown or something while they were installing it. The wallpaper was falling off the wall. They had, you know, strips that were this long and then strips were, the, well, it was just terrible. So I didn't know what to do. And Al's name was recommended to us. And he came, he took all that wallpaper off, he put it all back on, and it's still on there today. Mm. He, from that point on, Al was our go-to person for um, any kind of wallpapering, painting, inside and out. And in fact, when I told my children that Joanne's dad had passed away, they said, my adult children this is, they said, oh yes, I remember Mr. Eberly. He used to come and paint for us. So mm -hmm. they, they remember that too. I also have one other memory of him. He, um, well, two other memories. He you know, was very proud of his brothers and their fame as, as uh, singers and so forth. And so um, when I was still teaching, I used to do a special unit with my students called Backyard History. And I would take the class all down to the Miller Museum and they would go through and have the tour and then they each picked somebody famous from our community. Well, I wanted them to know that Hoosick Falls, what, you know, really had a, a mark on, on history, you know, and so they were quite surprised to learn about different things. Well, anyway, inevitably, they often would pick the Eberly brothers as one of their, one of their people to research. And then what we would do is they would sit down with someone who either knew the famous person from Hoosick Falls or a person that knew something about them. And so Al would come to the museum and the children would interview um, interview the person and they interviewed Al and he very proudly would share about his, his family and his brothers. And so that's another memory that I have. And then my most recent memory is any of you who attend a church regularly, you know, you kind of have a place in the church that is your pew, <laughs> right? And so that is my husband's and my pew, you know, and if we aren't there, people know that something's up, you know, but that's our pew. But Al's pew 
was right where my pocketbook is. He always sat right next to us. Bill and Joanne were on the end, Al would be in the middle, and then Bill and I would be on the other end. So he was my pew mate, and um, we will miss him. We will miss having him sitting there with us in church every Sunday, but as most of you have said, we know he's in a better place now, and the day will come when we will all be able to sing praises to the Lord together. So Amen. those are my remembrances. Amen. Thank you, Deb. Thank you so much. Bob, you just want those at home to be able to catch it. Just a little short memory of Al. Um, he used to bring my 97-year-old mom to church. And I don't think he always sat in that pew because he sat over there near my mom one day. <laughs> <laughs> and he had a little sparkle in his eye for it. <laughs> 90 years old. <laughs> Yeah, so Joanne and uh, Bill invited us over, so we were all sitting there for dinner. My mom, Clara, and Al, and, and uh, us younger folks. And uh, <laughs> my mom would bring up comments, and uh, Al was over there glistening at her. And, and uh, so we'd interrupt her comments, because some of them just weren't something you wanted to hear. <laughs> <laughs> with a song, and we picked all these old songs, Let Me Call You Sweetheart, and uh, um, I can't remember them all. Paper Mary, doll. What was Paper it? Doll. Paper Doll. That's she the one I was trying to remember. <laughs> he knew every word, he Paper Doll. Yeah. <laughs> so it was a great memory I for us to get the... <laughs> she remembered a lot of words, too, but it's great to know that at 90, you can still have a sparkle in your amen, eyes. Amen, amen. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Bob. We're going to have a brief fellowship time after the service, and I just would encourage you to maybe share a memory in that setting with the family of how Al touched your life. Give you one more moment. We'll move forward in our service. We have a reading from the book of Thessalonians. Thank you to whoever lowered this. <laughs> <laughs> this is a reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children. Encouraging, comforting. And urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Thank you, Mom. We have another musical selection, Father's Love. And full of questions You must have thought I was The smartest man alive I didn't always have The answers To every little how And where and why Like daddy was the sky so blue does Jesus really hear me when I pray? When I grow up, will I be just like you? Will I be tall and strong and brave? There is no power on A promise from heaven above No matter where you go Always know you can depend on 
your father's love Especially when it's cold Especially when you're lonely When your little heart's just trying to find its way I know the world is always changing But remember son, some things never change And even when my life on earth is through There still will be a part of me and you Cause some things are forever Nothing's ever gonna take my love from you No power on earth like your father's love, so big and so strong as your father's love. A promise that's sacred, a promise from heaven. Above. Did I hug did I care enough when you most needed me? Was I there enough? Enough to make you feel the power of your father? Friend, the Bible is God's word to us. In addition to revealing to us what God desires for us to know about the history of his salvation and guiding us to a true understanding of his purpose and will for us through our relationship to him in Christ, the scriptures provide great comfort and peace in times of stress, sorrow, and grief. So let us take comfort from these passages that I've chosen for today. The first from the Apostle Paul, when he was writing in the church at Corinth, he said, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. The shepherd king of Israel, David, wrote these words. He said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. 
Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The apostle John recorded these words of Jesus for us. Before he went to his passion, Jesus told his best friends, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. My devotion for today, I'm entitling The Less Famous Brother. Al Eberly was quite a character. He was funny and kind. He had a million megawatt smile that could light up a room. He had two older brothers who were famous singers back in the day, as Deb had mentioned. Al wasn't famous, but he was important to the many who are gathered here today. The Bible tells a story about a, quote, less famous brother, like Al, In the book of Genesis, the story is told of Joseph, the son of Jacob. He was the annoying younger brother who was favored by the father. One day when Joseph went to visit his brothers in the field, he'd been just relaxing at home with dad because he was the favorite. He went to visit the older brothers in the field. They conspired against him to kill him. After much discussion, Judah, one of the older brothers, convinced his angry siblings not to murder Joseph, but to sell him into slavery. Now the evil intentions of Joseph's older brothers were no match for God's good intentions for his servant Joseph. What the brothers meant for ill, God turned into blessing. What they placed before him as a stumbling block, God turned into a stepping stone. There's no doubt that Joseph was the most famous of the 12 sons of Jacob, but there is a special place, in my humble opinion, for Judah in God's hall of fame. Had Judah not convinced the other brothers to spare the life of Joseph, they would all have perished in the subsequent famine that swept the known world. And it is said later of Judah by Jacob the father, as he's dying, he blesses and prophesies over each of his children. And this is what Jacob said of Judah. He said, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him. And Bible scholars, Jewish and Christian alike, feel that this is a very clear reference that Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah. Though in their day, Joseph was more famous and more powerful than Judah, ultimately, God brought great blessing through Judah's life as Jesus would ultimately be born of his lineage. So what of Al? His brothers, Bob and Ray, were world-renowned singers, Bob with the Jimmy Dorsey Band and Ray with the Glenn Miller Orchestra. Al, in comparison, lived a quiet life here in Hoosick Falls working hard and raising his family. Was his name known across the land? No, he was not famous nor powerful. But, here's the kicker. (laughs) He was a faithful husband and a kind and caring father and a generous friend to those who knew him. On the bulletin for today's service are these words, from the Apostle Paul's life. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who loved his appearing. Not long ago, Alfred gave me a gift. 
there was a video disc about the return of Christ. Al wanted me to see and to share his excitement about the coming of our king. He longed for Jesus' appearing. And like the Apostle Paul, Alfred had a crown waiting for him on the 26th of December. A crown. He may not have been famous or powerful in this life, but Al Eberly is royalty in the life to come. He was a son of the king. And being the son of the king makes him what? A prince. He's royalty. His quiet but meaningful life of faithfulness has now been rewarded by his savior. So what of you, friend? I'll look forward to the coming of Christ. Do you? Have you chosen to repent and turn from your sins and to embrace Christ as Lord and Master? Have you made that same decision for yourself that Al made before you? Friends, your decisions have consequences. God is not going to force you to bow your heart to him. But if you choose not to, then you will face an eternity without Christ. Friend, make your decision today to to surrender yourself to the Savior. It is the greatest choice you will ever make in your life. If you do, God will empower you to live a quiet and faithful life like he empowered Al. We're going to have a chance now to hear a song that sums up the feelings for many of us here today. Al may not have been famous or powerful, but for many of us, he was a true, if unsung, hero. Say words 
kindly bow your heads again, I'd like to uh, spend a few moments praying for, for all of us, for the family. Father God, we are so grateful for the opportunity to be gathered today to celebrate the life of Alfred. Lord, we're grateful for a life well lived. Al was funny and kind and generous, hard working, caring. We thank you, Father, for how he uh, brought light and goodness into our lives. We're grateful for his faith walk, Lord, that seemed to deepen as he got uh, closer to the end of his days, Lord, that he just loved Jesus more and more. What a wonderful example that is for us. Father, I pray for his children, that they would know strength, Lord, in the midst of their grief, Joy in the midst of their sorrow. Father, that you would help them as they go forward. Lord, as they receive from Al that that baton, as it were, in running the race of life, Lord, that they they would run hard the race that is before them. These words from Paul who said that he had He had run the race and and finished in faith, Lord, that you would bless each of his children, grandchildren, Lord, great-grandchildren, God, that they they would know your grace, embrace your grace. Father, I think of holidays to come, and Alfred won't be here the hole in their heart, Lord, the empty chair at the table, that you would fill those blank spaces with your presence, Father. That warm memories of Al's life would would be a comfort in those times of missing him. God, we live in turbulent times where kindness and goodness are in short supply. Would you gift this dear family, Lord, with the strength to make the choice that Al did to live well for your glory and honor. God, we're grateful for the comfort of your scripture that Jesus told his closest friends before he went to his own death that he was preparing a place for them, that there are mansions in glory that you have for your children, Lord. And we look forward to being reunited, Lord, in your fullness of time, whenever that may be for each of us, God. And if we should live long enough to see the return of Christ, that we would be caught up with all the believers, Lord, to meet Jesus in the air as Paul says in Thessalonians, Lord, we believe that not to be just a sweet story, but to be history that is yet to be seen. God, we believe that's going to happen. Should you grant us strength and health, Lord, to to live that long, that we will be reunited, Lord, uh, with Alfred. For those of us who have put our faith and trust in Christ like he did, Lord, that we will be together again someday soon. Father, thank you for the joy of being gathered in this sanctuary. And Lord, we lift worship and praise to you in our time of sorrow and need. Lord, we know you're a good God and that you will carry us through. We bless you, Father, in the sweet name of Jesus. Amen. We believe in the resurrection of those who've put their faith in Christ. And our next song is called Risen.
When darkness filled the sky, the day that Jesus died, in agony upon the bitter cross, they took his body down and laid it in a tomb. His friends believed that everything was lost. But when the third day came, the darkness turned to light. For Mary heard her name and saw the living Christ risen to set the captives free. Changed for hope was born when Jesus rose that day, and still his wounded hand revealed the love he has for every fallen soul he came to save, and he will come again and one by one will rise. final prayers of committal, uh, final scripture, and then our benediction. Join your hearts with me again as I pray. For as much as it has pleased Almighty God in his great mercy to take unto himself the soul of our brother, Alfred John Emmanuel Smith Eberly, we therefore commit his remains to your care, O Lord, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Knowing that it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, we make this committal in the confidence that the day is coming when all who in the tombs will hear his voice and come forth, some to the resurrection of life, and others to the resurrection of judgment. Father God, may the souls of the faithfully departed, through your mercy, rest in peace. Amen. Now from the book of James, we have a final reading. (coughs) 
Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he is to the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Amen. If you're able to rise to your feet for the benediction, I'll be praying over you the prayer commanded of the Lord from Numbers chapter 6. I'll sing in Hebrew and then English translation. Thank you so much for coming to this service and there is a reception to follow. Yes? Candlelight. Thank you. I almost forgot. Be seated for a moment. <laughs> How could I forget? Uh, Christmas uh, was a special time uh, for Al, uh, as it is for many of us. And uh, we have a holy habit here at our Christmas Eve service uh, to light candles. Uh, word of instruction as we do that. That uh, the lit candle remains uh, upright and the unlit candle grabs the flame uh, from the lit candle. So we have a uh, song about uh, Christmas in heaven and uh, I did pray earlier about holidays that are coming when Al will not be here. But uh, it's wonderful to think about him celebrating all the holidays with his Savior. So we'll hear that as the light goes forth.
Alfred lived a powerful life. He may not have been famous like his brothers, but he touched many people. Tiny little flames, but how they spread the light. Friends, we can, we can live like that. You can ask for the Holy Spirit's power to come and fill us and use us for God's glory and for the blessing of those around us. That's how I'll live. That's the owl that I knew. If you could stand now for the blessing. Keep your candles lit if you don't mind. I will sing. God's word over you. Avareka Adonai Vaishmareka Yaer Adonai Panave Lecha Vihuneka Yaer Adonai Panave Lecha Vayashem Lecha Shalom The Lord bless you and keep you The Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace and give you peace and give you peace forever and give you peace and give you peace and give you peace forever. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us. Please, if you can stay, we'll have uh, refreshments in a time of fellowship. Thank you and God bless you.